This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, May you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 73 of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History podcast. Today is Thursday, October 19th, 2017. My name is Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. On this episode, we finally introduce someone who's been long overdue for our historical timeline, Heber C. Kimball. Maybe you guys can help me come up with a fitting name or nickname for him. After that, we jump into a letter that Bennett wrote to the Brethren to be published in the Times and Seasons, stating that the Nauvoo Charter had finally passed the Illinois State Legislature. Bennett was a powerful lobbyist and ally to have on the Mormon side, And he specifically gave a few shout-outs to some government officials in this letter who were paramount to the Charter's success. Then we find out that God gave a sign in the heavens to the Mormon missionaries in England, signaling the passing of the Nauvoo Charter. Legends are easily born, but seem to never die. After that, we're joined by a special guest who recently dove really deep into the Book of Mormon to try and make sense of it all. I wish him the best of luck. Patreon supporters, be sure to listen to this episode in the Patreon feed to hear the special extended interview that we have with Colt. Let's get into it. Let's get a little bit of milk to start us off. When we last left off our historical timeline, we were discussing land speculation in and around Nauvoo, or what was soon to be designated Nauvoo. Joe was purchasing land left and right, on which the Mormons would begin settling, and was doing so through means of nothing but credit. Joe was running a massive deficit, because he had no way to make any of the payments for the land he was purchasing. He was just signing every land contract which would come his way, even when the contracts were woefully damaging to his long-term goals. Joe paid over 30 times the going rate for unimproved land, and was turning around and selling it to the Mormons with hopes of making profit somehow. Unfortunately for everyone, the Mormons were desperately poor, and there was no way that Joe could sell the incredibly inflated land at the rates that he was purchasing, so he was only dragging himself and the Mormon church further into debt. Hotchkiss, Gillett, White, Gallant, you know, those were just some of the primary land speculators looking to make a quick buck off of the Mormons' misfortunes. But unfortunately for them, they weren't getting any money for the land that they had sold to Joe on contract, because a piece of paper with Joe's signature and $5 wouldn't get somebody halfway to a bushel of corn back then. Robert Flanders, in his book Nauvoo, Kingdom on the Mississippi, makes a solid case that Nauvoo was, by definition, a land speculation. So... Any aspersions cast upon Joe and the Mormon leadership handling Nauvoo land was well-founded, but no other option existed for building up Nauvoo from the desolate swampland it was before the Mormons had arrived. After the historical timeline, we did a Mormon Leaks Minute with Ethan Dodge, and I offered some thoughts on the Myth Information Conference, and subsequently published a later conversation that I had with Murray right after the conference, which you can find in your podcast feed. So that wraps up the milk. Let's chow down on some meat. As the scriptures say, they must have milk before meat. I'm going to start off the episode today by talking about an email that I should have addressed long ago, which makes a really good point and actually introduces an opportunity for us to work together in our historical timeline. This email came from Aaron talking about John Bennett, who I gave the name nickname of John Brokett. This is Aaron's email. Quote, 
Regarding episode 62, John broke it? To me, you just missed the perfect name I had in my head that I thought you were going to say seconds before you named him. How about wreck it Bennett? <laughs> Do you think this name name flows off the tongue a little easier and would stick in the mind a little better? Um, yes, I do. It's much better than John broke it. He goes on to say, would wreck it Bennett be too close to Disney's wreck it Ralph to use? I mean, I, for legal issues, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it's perfectly fitting. Um, and he finishes out the email. I love how you name these guys for Mormon history, which helps me keep them straight in my head. Martin Harris will always be for me. Not so smarty Marty solidifying a place in my mind's history logs End quote. So <laughs> That's Aaron's email, and notwithstanding my reply email, I think Aaron makes a really good argument, and I personally believe that wreck Bennett is way better and more memorable, and it does roll off the tongue a lot better, so we're going to change John Bennett from John Broke It to wreck Bennett from now on. It's just way better. And the opportunity this represents is great, because, you know, I, I've come up with a bunch of name nicknames in the past. And some better than others. But maybe you guys can be like Aaron here and come up with much better names for these people than I am able to. So why don't we just get the ball rolling on this? We're going to introduce someone today who's part of our timeline for a long time, but is really going to start making his place important in the coming years. Let's talk about Heber C. Kimball. And let's see which one of you listeners will come up with a fitting name or nickname for our historical timeline and get a shout out on the next episode. For some background, Heber C. Kimball, who, in my opinion, looks like a cross between the Joseph Smith Sr. in the Joseph Smith movies and Brian Cranston, uh, but very bald. He was, <laughs> he was born in Sheldon, Vermont in 1801. He had training as a blacksmith and a potter, and he married his lovely wife, Violet, or Violate, I think, Murray, in 1822, after which he joined the Ontario County New York Freemasons in 1823. He received the York Rite of the Masonic Society, ascending the first three degrees in a very short time. He followed up by petitioning the Royal Arch Masonic Society to ascend their degrees, but unfortunately for Heber C. Kimball... In response to the death of William Morgan due to his expose on the Masons, an anti-Masonic mob had burned down the lodge, so Kimball wasn't able to perform the next rituals to further ascend through Masonry. So Heber C. and Violet Kimball, who were actually really good friends with the Young family, that's Brigham and Phineas and Joseph Young, they had a young Helen Mar Kimball who was born on August 22nd, 1828, when Joe had just finished writing the 116 pages with Not-So-Smarty Marty Harris. Three elders first proselyted to the Kimballs in late 1831, and the family moved to Kirtland, Ohio in 1833. Heber Kimball then went on with Zion's camp out to Missouri to redeem Zion, as the prophet sought, and was subsequently ordained a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles during its original organization in February 1835. Kimball participated in the first Mormon mission overseas to England in 1837, which was met with very minor success. Later, when the Mormons were exterminated from Missouri, Bloody Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball acted together as the head organizers of the Mormon exodus to Illinois— showing each other how well they worked together. Heber Kimball would continue to solidify his position as Bloody Brigham's best friend and second in command. In our historical timeline, Heber C. Kimball is currently hanging out with Brigham and the rest of the Quorum of the Twelve in England prior to them heading back to America in early 1841. Here are some other fun facts about Heber C. Kimball that it, they may just help spawn some nicknames in all of our minds. He was a visionary man and a poet. Oh, and he loved his polygamy. <laughs> we'll get into it in a second. But Heber told of a vision that he saw the same night that the unnamed angel visit Joe in September of 1827 and gave him the gold plates. This is from Heber Kimball's biography, written by Orson F. Whitney, published in 1888. So, it's a little while after where we're sitting in our historical timeline. This is telling of Heber C. Kimball's vision on the night of September 27th. Quote, I had retired to bed when John P. Green, who was living within a hundred steps of my house, came and waked me up, calling upon me to come out and behold the scenery in the heavens. 
I woke up and called my wife and sister Fanny Young, sister to Brigham Young, who was living with us, and we went out of doors. It was one of the most beautiful starlight nights, so clear that we could see to pick up a pin. We looked to the eastern horizon and beheld a white smoke arose toward the heavens. As it ascended, it formed itself into a belt and made a noise like the sound of a mighty wind and continued southwest, forming a regular bow dipping in the western horizon. After the bow had formed, it began to widen out and grow clear and transparent of a bluish cast. It grew wide enough to contain twelve men abreast. In this bow, an army formed, commencing from the east and marching to the west. They continued marching until they reached the western horizon. They moved in platoons and walked so close that the rear ranks trod in the steps of their file leaders until the bow was literally crowded with soldiers. We could distinctly see the muskets, bayonets, and knapsacks of the men who wore caps and feathers like those used by the American soldiers in the last war with Britain, and also saw their officers with their swords and equipage, and the clashing and jingling of their implements of war, and could discover the forms and features of the men. The most profound order existed throughout the entire army. And when he's, I mean, he's talking about this all as an apparition in the sky. I mean, this is incredible. When the foremost man stepped, every man stepped at the same time. I could hear the steps. When the front rank reached the western horizon, a battle ensued, and we could distinctly hear the report of arms in the rush. No man could judge my feelings when I beheld that army of men as plainly as ever I saw armies of men in the flesh. I mean, he was seeing this in his uh, second sight, as they would call it. It seemed as though every hair of my head was alive. Yeah, I've been there. The scenery we gazed upon for hours until it began to disappear. After I became acquainted with Mormonism, I learned that this took place the same evening that Joseph Smith received the records of the Book of Mormon from the angel Moroni, who held those records in his possession. My wife, being frightened at what she saw, said, Father Young, what does all this mean? Why, it is one of the signs of the coming of the Son of Man, he replied in a lively, pleased manner. The next night, similar scenery was beheld in the West by the neighbors, representing armies of men who were engaged in battle. End quote. I think this account of Heber Kimball's visionary experience, published 61 years after the supposed occurrence from a second-hand account offers a wonderful insight to how a story or a legend can develop when someone watches the Aurora Borealis on mushrooms or something, and then goes about and tells a friend who tells a friend who tells their child who writes it down later as a factual occurrence with actual supposed quotes and exact dates. Hebrew the Dreamer, maybe? Hmm. All right, but wait, there's way more to quote Heber Kimball on, this time when it comes to his views on women and polygamy, which we'll be getting into very soon in our timeline. Here are just a few quotes that I want to share with you guys. Quote, women are made to be led and counseled and directed. And if I am not a good man, I have no just right in this church to a wife or wives or the power to propagate my species. What then should be done with me? Make a eunuch of me and stop my propagation. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Half man Heber? Something like that? Uh, try this quote on for size. Quote, It is the duty of a woman to be obedient to her husband. And unless she is, I would not give a damn for all her queenly right and authority, nor for her either, if she will quarrel and lie about the work of God and the principle of plurality. End quote. Maybe uh, King Me Kimball or something there, right? And th this is my favorite quote from him. Quote, I think no more of taking a wife than I do of buying a cow. End quote. <laughs> it should be noted that sometimes that, uh, that quote is recounted as taking another wife instead of taking a wife. Uh, but uh, being is that he was a prolific polygamist, I think that uh, adding another in there really doesn't matter one way or another. So who thinks about, you know, Hebrew lingo, something like that. So, okay, those are just some possibilities, right? These various quotes from Heber C. Kimball can go on for days revealing his true character, but I'm going to spare you any more anguish with this. That's who we have to work with as our newest inductee into the ranks of Nemo nicknames. Which do you like best, Heber the Dreamer, Half-Man Heber, King Me Kimball, or Heber Lingo? 
Or are you going to be like Aaron and come up with a way better name for Heber Kimball by tweeting it at Naked Mormonism with hashtag Nemo nickname? Or you can post it on the Facebook page and quote this tweet or by emailing at NakedMormonism at gmail.com. And you're going to get a shout out on next week's episode and be lauded with fame and fortune. And I have neither of those to promise to you. The ball is in your court, dear listener. Let's see how clever you are. Let's see if you can come up with something like Aaron did. So now that we've introduced Heber C. Kimball, let's briefly catch up with him and Brigham during their mission by talking about one meeting that they had with the Brotherton family. And we don't know exactly what occurred during this meeting, but we can assume it was much like any of the other proselyting meetings that Heber C. Kimball and Bloody Brigham held in small congregations to convert and baptize supposed investigators. The Brotherton family, consisting of Thomas and Sarah, along with daughters Elizabeth and 16-year-old Martha, were convinced by what the charismatic missionaries were selling, and they converted, being baptized sometime in mid to late 1840. They would soon migrate to America, landing in New Orleans on November 9th, 1841, um, and then getting to Nauvoo very soon after that. And we're just going to have to keep the Brotherton family in the back of our mind for now. So let's pick things back up on the state side and see what trouble Joe and company were getting into. Now we kind of caught up with the quorum a little bit. The Illinois state legislature were finally going through the process of ratifying the Nauvoo City Charter. Reckitt Bennett, there it is, thank you Aaron, was sent by Joe to lobby the legislature and ensure the passage of the charter, even including those extra provisions that they added about the Nauvoo University and the Nauvoo Legion. Reckitt Bennett wrote to the Brethren in Nauvoo from Springfield on the 16th of December, 1840, with no reservation of glee in his own success. This letter was immediately published in the church periodical Times and Seasons, and I'm reading it from the Dan Vogel History of the Church, Volume 5, page 247. Hang in there with me. That's a little bit long, but there's a lot to talk about here. Quote, The act incorporating the city of Nauvoo has just passed the Council of Revision and is now a law of the land to take effect and be in force from and after the first Monday of February next. The aforesaid act contains two additional charters, one incorporating the Nauvoo Legion, the other the University of the City of Nauvoo. All these charters are very broad and liberal, conferring the most plenary powers on the corporators. Illinois has acquitted herself with honor, and her state legislators shall never be forgotten. Every power we asked has been granted, every request gratified, every desire fulfilled. In the Senate, Mr. Little canceled every obligation to our people, and faithfully and honestly and with untiring diligence discharged every obligation devolving upon him as our immediate representative in the upper house. Mark well that man and do him honor. Snyder and Ralston and Moore and Ross and Stapp and numerous others likewise in that branch of our state government rendered as very essential services, and the act passed that body without a dissenting voice. In the House of Representatives, Charles, our immediate representative in the lower house, was at his post and discharged his duty as a faithful representative. He is an acting and not a talking man, and has fulfilled all his obligations to us. Many members in this house, likewise, were warmly in our favor, and with only one or two dissenting voices, every representative appeared inclined to extend to all such powers as they considered us justly entitled to and voted for the law. And here I should not forget to mention that Lincoln, whose name we erased from the electoral ticket in November, Not, however, on account of any dislike to him as a man, but simply because he was the last name on the ticket and we desired to show our friendship to the Democratic Party by substituting the name of Ralston for someone of the Whigs, had the magnanimity to vote for our act and came forward after the final vote to the bar of the House and cordially congratulated me on its passage. Our worthy governor is certainly disposed to do us ample justice in every respect, and to extend to us every facility to our future happiness and prosperity. This is just a a time of really good feelings, apparently. Final paragraph. Illinois has certainly done her duty, and her whole duty. 
And now it becomes us to show ourselves upright, honest, just, worthy of the favors bestowed by noble, generous, and magnanimous statement. I have said that we are a law-abiding people, and we must now show it. <laughs> the state has washed her hands in granting all our petitions, and if we do not show ourselves approved, the curse must fall upon our own heads. Justice, equal justice, should be our fixed object and purpose, and the great God will prosper us. Length of days will be in our right hand and in our left glory and honor. All right, here I'm about to butcher some Latin, but apparently Bennett had some kind of crazy hard on for Latin. In necessaris unitas, in non necessaris libertas, in omnibus charitas. <laughs> this is terrible. Should be our motto in the consummation of the great object, human liberty and equal rights. And with the sauveteur in mode and the fortier in re, we must ultimately succeed in overcoming all unjust prejudice and unreasonable opposition. Yours, etc. John C. Bennett. End quote. All right, I'll freely admit that I probably didn't need to read that entire letter to you, but there are actually quite a few things to talk about in each paragraph. So let's just kind of deconstruct it here. The first paragraph showed Reckitt Bennett's excitement at the prospect of Nauvoo having its own legion and the uh, Smith University, right, which were both provisions that were written into the charter. Creating a city university wasn't too far out of the norm for other city charters of the day, but the Nauvoo Legion definitely was, which we've discussed in prior episodes. The second and third paragraph can be analyzed together, which I'm going to do in just a second here. But the final paragraph, I, I absolutely loved it because that was Bennett's way of commending Illinois for doing her duty and her whole duty to the Mormons. And the, the way Reckitt Bennett couched his excitement was interesting to me. And it, it almost seemed like he was giving a voice of warning to the Mormons, right? I mean, he says this, now it becomes us to show ourselves upright, honest, just worthy of the favors bestowed. And he said later, I have said that we are a law abiding people and we must show it. I mean, this was Bennett's way of telling the Mormons, guys, we really can't fuck it up this time. I mean, he didn't want the Mormons making a liar out of him. And I find it amazing that Bennett had to do this, <laughs> but, but really, I mean, come on. Bennett knew the history of the saints. He'd read all of the headlines coming out of Missouri when they were kicked out, and he must have known that they were dancing on a knife's edge with the Illinois state legislature because the Missouri government had kicked the Mormons out. <laughs> it's just incredible to me. So let's get to the second and third paragraphs because they actually represent a very interesting relationship building exercise between the Illinois government and the Mormons. Having a massive population of people moving into a completely uninhabited area was an exciting economic prospect for Illinois, especially because the state of Illinois was on the brink of complete insolvency. And it's only thanks to Governor Thomas Carlin that they were able to pull themselves out. One great way to drag an economy out of ruins is by having a 20 to 30 year long plan of a bunch of people settle an area and turn it into useful farmland, which would hopefully become a thriving metropolis with manufacturing and shipping up and down the Mississippi. Even better for some Illinois government officials, the Mormons voted as a block. You know, you get a, the approval of a few higher ups in Mormon leadership and suddenly you have 15,000 votes in your column and more importantly, 15,000 votes against your opponent. Well, I, I have to qualify that. I suppose it, it since it was only men over 21 who could vote, that probably was only about 5,000 votes at best. But that 5,000 was double the possible votes coming out of Chicago, and it was four times the number of votes coming out of the capital, Springfield. By 1844, Nauvoo had a larger voting population than Chicago and Springfield combined. Politicians wanted to be on the Mormons' good side. But it, it, we can't ignore this, that the Mormons presented an opportunity to the state in the form of improving the economy and pushing change through the government. 
The Mormons were actually one of the largest swing vote populations in America at this time when most populations were already sanctioned off as Democrat or Whig. But the Mormons didn't hold much loyalty to either party, especially given the ever-growing diversity of their population from so many states and even people immigrating over from Europe. When Reckitt Bennett named those government officials in his letter, that was his way of signaling them that they would have the Mormon vote if they stayed on the Mormons' good side. And you can bet that his lobbying efforts in getting the charter passed in the first place was laden with promises. You know, hey, if you vote to pass this charter, I'll see to it that not a single Mormon votes for your opponent in your upcoming election next year. Wink, nod, elbow rub, back scratch, etc., etc. I mean, you know how these things go. That's how lobbying works. And because Illinois was largely a Whig state at this time, or, well, yeah, kind of, at least most of the large population centers and public offices were held by Whigs, they favored urbanization and industrialization. The Mormons moving into an area and improving it in first into farmland, then to industry and shipping was an exciting proposition for the typical Whig platform issues albeit it was a two- to three-decade-long plan that would never come to fruition for a number of reasons. But the prospect of it was exciting. Reckitt Bennett did, however, I, we, I have to talk about this, he did invoke uh, very briefly a name which I found rather interesting in this letter. He said this, quote, And here I should not forget to mention that Lincoln, whose name we erased from the electoral ticket in November— meaning that the Mormons may have been able to vote for him, but they didn't vote for him because uh, and they, they, they took his name off of the electoral ticket in Nauvoo. But they didn't do that because they disliked him. They just did it because they wanted a Democrat on the ticket as well as the Whigs, and Ralston was a Democrat, whereas uh, Lincoln was a Whig. So uh, that, that when he says that that he has to uh, he has to mention this guy Lincoln, uh, and he had the magnanimity to vote for our act and came forward after the final vote to the bar of the house and cordially congratulated me on its passage. End quote. And yes, that's exactly who you're thinking it is. Abraham Lincoln was only three and a half years younger than Joe. He was born in 1809. And he had begun his meteoric rise through elected offices around the same time that Joe started becoming successful in Kirtland, you know, very early 1830s. Lincoln had just barely won his fourth term in the House of Representatives. That was a mere four months prior to the Nauvoo Charter hitting the legislative December session. And he had the Whig industrialization mindset and the political foresight to appeal to the Mormons when they were starting to become a voting bloc to reckon with. So that's probably why he came up and congratulated Reckitt Bennett after the Nauvoo Charter was passed and they were all hanging out at the bar afterwards. Luckily for Lincoln, he didn't do anything to piss off Bennett. So he had the collective ignorance of the Mormons, or, you know, he is at least operating in their blind spot. And he certainly didn't land himself on their bad side. So huge kudos to Lincoln, the pragmatist here. To be fair, though, Lincoln delivered his first speech against slavery a mere three years before this happened. So while the diversity of the Mormons was increasing as their missionary efforts were increasing, they were still largely northerners who were either indifferent or directly opposed to slavery. But the majority of the political and social opposition against the Mormons in Missouri came at the hands of good old boy slave-owning Democrats. Any elected official who was opposed to the everyday country bumpkin southern Democrat slave owner was a friend of the Mormons. So Abraham Lincoln fit the bill perfectly. I have to say, I love these little confluences of American history that I never foresee until it just randomly crops up in my research. You know, th this letter was written 18 years before uh, Lincoln's great House Divided speech and 20 years before his actual election. There's no way that Bennett could have known Lincoln's influential future, but apparently Lincoln left enough of an impression on Bennett that his name merited mention above and beyond the other legislators who had voted to push the Nauvoo Charter through the Illinois legislature. 
And I assume it was due to them chatting at the bar the day that the charter passed that Lincoln stood out as somebody above and beyond everybody else to wreck at Bennett. So I guess I, I don't know how to uh, to really wrap that up into a, in a single thought and put a bow on it. But I, I do want to say um, in order to conclude the historical portion of today's episode, we're we're going to finish where we started. This was a sign from the heavens. No, that's literally what it's called. Just like Heber Kimball saw some kind of phenomenon happening in the sky, and he took it as a sign that the angel had visited Joseph Smith and given him the plates, another sign was seen in the heavens, undoubtedly exhibiting God's approval of the Nauvoo Charter passing to the quorum living in England at the time, who wouldn't get word of its passage for another couple of months. This is starting from page 251 of volume 5 of the Dan Vogel History of the Church. And before reading it, I find it fascinating that this was included in the history of the church at all. Vogel added a footnote which states the MST, which is the the manuscript history, uh, book one, page 215, includes the following introduction. This is the... Uh, the introduction that prefaced this that they removed when it was actually drafted into the documentary history of the church. Quote, the following account is taken from a printed sheet, which has lately been published and is supposed to be authentic, but we cannot now readily ascertain the exact date of this singular occurrence, end quote, which is really interesting. And so when they put it in the manuscript history of the church before it was actually printed, they they printed at the beginning of this story that we we think that it's true we suppose it's authentic but we don't know exactly where it came from or the date that this happened and then after that that footnote you know implies that this was later removed and then another footnote says that the heading was changed from signs in the heavens to signs in the sky and of course thanks to Dan Vogel's tireless research in compiling his version of the history of the church showing all of the changes that have happened we read it as signs in the heavens. So this is the, the article. Quote, A most wonderful phenomenon was observed last week by the inhabitants of Hull and the neighborhood. A perfectly blood-red flag was seen flying in the heavens, which illuminated the horizon for many miles around. At intervals, it changed its form, assuming that of a cross, sword, and many other shapes. At one o'clock on Friday morning, so once again, really late at night, the town was nearly as light as noonday, just like he or Kimmel described. The inhabitants were parading the streets, fear and dismay pictured in their countenances. This wonder continued until near three o'clock, when it gradually went to the westward, illuminating the Humber as it seemed to sink in her waters. Then for a few seconds, all became total darkness. When from the northwest by north arose the most beautiful light, which shot away towards the western hemisphere, leaving in its train the most beautiful and variegated colors, and which the eye might readily form into armies, drawn up in the order of battle, charging and retreating alternately, and then again all was wrapped in the sable curtains of night. It appears that many signs were seen on the same night in different parts of the kingdom." End quote. In a pre-scientific world, like the one that our heroes and villains inhabit, things like this propagate and birth legends. The various celestial phenomena we have scientific grasp of today would have understandably exploded the brains of these troglodyte simpletons. But to them, God was giving them a sign by which they judged their actions and lives. Once you separate out a spurious account like what Heber the visionary told somebody about or, you know, a reprint of an unsourced newspaper article that I can't seem to find a single original source for, no matter how deep I dig in searching for this, is it really all that hard to see how things like this become legends that never die? You know, luckily, we're analyzing history that happened after the invention of the printing press, and the Mormons were printing themes. Mormon history doesn't have the mystery and lack of evidence most other religions are fortuned with. 19th century people with a slightly scientific understanding of the world were much less vulnerable to creating legends than people 2,000 years ago. 
And I would argue that legends have an even harder time propagating today than they did in the 19th century. We're smarter now. We know more things now. People know more stuff about more things now than they ever have in the history of the entire world. And that's only come through wider spread communication and access to information. This isn't to say that humans are completely inoculated from bullshit today. We still fling plenty of it around. But now we have the tools that the world has never had before to wash the bullshit off and figure out what is actually truth. Where teaching somebody in the 19th century was an impossibility before due to lack of collective knowledge and willful ignorance, we now have the knowledge to shatter ignorance if we but remove people's will to be ignorant. All right, today we are joined by a, a new friend of mine I just met this evening, uh, Colt Kalsich. I believe that's how you say his name. Colt, welcome to the show. How are you doing tonight, man? Thank you. Good pronunciation. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm, thank you for coming on. We kind of did the spur of the moment. You just sent me a document that I really want to discuss with you. Um, but before we do, I want to get a little bit of background on you, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about yourself. Do you mind uh, telling us a little bit, you know, kind of about yourself, your walk through Mormonism and, you know, kind of catch us up to how we got here today? So I want to talk to you now. Uh, let's let's talk about this paper that you sent over because you have compiled a fascinating uh, 15 page document of a study that you did for. Um, let me ask, is this posted up anywhere? Is there anywhere that this is posted online that people can can refer to this? It's not. Um, I think if you uh, added it to your end of timeline for this, it probably be the first time it would be posted. Well, we'll have to uh, we'll have to talk about that off of the air because okay. I think this definitely this information needs to be out there. But uh, can you kind of introduce the listeners to what it is that we're looking at on on, on our computer screens right now? Okay. So just a couple months ago, actually, after listening to the Naked Mormonism podcast. Um, there was a comment on there about Enos or Jacob being just an unruly, outrageous number when he died. Um, mm -hmm. So that got me thinking, um, just to skepticize everything and just wondering, like, <laughs> how old were the people in the Book of Mormon? Uh, what kind of lives did they actually lead instead of just focusing on the spiritual aspects? And this was a fairly easy paper for me to put together. I put together most of it in less than a week, uh, just because okay. I enjoyed it so much. I was just at the computer and my wife was yelling at me to stop writing down stuff. <laughs> so, okay, so this paper is, let's just kind of describe it to the listeners here. Okay. It is essentially a work of a timeline of the people who were writers for the Book of Mormon in the supposed timeline of the Book of Mormon, as it claims. You sure. said in, uh, I think it's your fourth paragraph here, it says, as far as we can tell, these dates were originally added in the Book of Mormon by the Apostle Elder James E. Talmadge in the 1920s. And that's where, where you know, most book of, Books of Mormon, at the bottom of each page, it says approximately whatever, A.D. or uh, B.C., the dating on it. Th that was all done by James E. Talmadge. But you went much deeper than anything James E. Talmadge did. You actually included birth and death dates uh, with a tight margin of error for each one of the writers of the Book of Mormon. And that's why I think this is an invaluable study to uh, to try and, and discuss here, because this is something that I have never seen anywhere on the Internet before. And it does – Raise some fascinating questions about the the supposed timeline, the claimed timeline of the Book of Mormon. So, do you want to like uh, kind of qualify the study for us uh, and kind of what you did and how you did it? Okay, so what I wanted to do is just figure out. Um, and my original question for this study was: Does the chronology fit in and of itself, based on the Book of Mormon's own writing? So, I'm basically only looking at the Book of Mormon to determine the historicity and whether the timeline is correct. Because we have a start okay. date of 600 BC, we have an end date of 425, uh, or whatever year that was that Moroni buried the plates. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have a whole bunch of stuff in between. 
And from reading the Book of Mormon so many times throughout my life and my mission, I knew that there was birth and death dates for some of the writers. So what I wanted to do was just figure out, uh, did the chronology fit? And I was especially interested around the time of Alma the Elder, um, how he was going to and from Zarahemla, and did that chronology fit? Because uh, originally, as a believing member of the church, I was always fascinated and I always testified like, hey, the Book of Mormon is so complex, it jumps chronology front to back. It is just way too hard that anybody could write this in such a short amount of time. So that was my question is, uh, does a chronology fit? Um, and is it as complicated as I thought it really was? Okay. And you, you're just taking this at face value, right? You're not, you're not making any, uh, postulations about authorship or about how these things are constructed. You're just granting the Book of Mormon at face value and discussing the plausibility of it fitting the timeline that it claims. A am I correct in saying that? That is correct. And there's a couple reasons for that. So one, there's questions of, what year exactly was Jesus born? Was it 4 BC, 1 AD, 2 BC, and the reign of Zedekiah? Did it begin 600 BC or 604 BC? And so a lot of people will point to these different facts and studies um, to show that the Book of Mormon is, is or is not correct. What I want to do is look just at the Book of Mormon, their timeline, and using the information that Elder Talmadge helped create in 1920 uh, to help us determine the chronology and basically did it fit. And were there any major concerns that someone reading the book for spiritual purposes just would not realize? Okay. Do you mind reading the pre-summary paragraph to your paper? Because I think that qualifies what we're about to discuss quite well. Yeah. And so this is some of the information and, I guess what I did, a lot of this is in narrative form, and then I did a couple addendums where it's much easier to look at, um, and you can see people's death and birth dates based on their contemporaries. But uh, th So this is part of the narrative form, a pre-summary. And this entire thing with the charts that I have, I mean, it's 15 pages, but, but the pre-summary is one paragraph, and it says, Across the Book of Mormon, Generations... We have six men living to be at least 90 years, and two of them living to be more than 120 years. Five men have children after the age of 60 years, with Amos 1 setting a record of becoming a father again at the age of 97 years. <laughs> uh, so, I'm just, I'm just surprised. Becoming a father at the age of 97 years old, um, that seems um, almost unprecedented even today with today's like modern science and medicine. I mean, is that something that we see in any culture prior to modern day or even in the modern day that you're aware of? So I did just a cursory search of the internet just to kind of check my facts throughout the paper. Um, and there have been men that have been noted to have had children in their 80s. And I, I think there was even one at 92, 93, early 90s. Um, so it's not completely impossible. Uh, obviously, most of us have, don't know anybody in their 70s or older that have had kids, male or female, but um, it is possible. Yes. Okay. Uh, fascinating. Okay. I didn't want to cut you off, but I, no, I had to just pause there because that just seems appalling. <laughs> uh, but yeah, please continue reading that paragraph. Um, and specifically, it's good to note because the question a lot of apologists or other people might wonder is, well, is he inflating these numbers? I tried really hard that when it was possible to err on the side of caution and to bring okay. those numbers down. So it is possible to, I think that's the minimum age that he had a kid was at 97. More likely it's after, but I'm definitely erring on the side of caution. There. Interesting. And actually, we'll, we'll get into this in a second, but you made a couple of assumptions throughout here, but they were necessary assumptions because there isn't necessarily a hard timeline chronology set out in the Book of Mormon that wasn't right. uh, put forward by James E. Talmadge. But we'll, we'll discuss those assumptions in a second here. But I think um, it, the rest of that first paragraph kind of introduces 
some interesting points that once we discuss the timeline will really come into play. Okay, so the next sentence says, we're missing about 10 generations over the span of the millennia the Book of Mormon covers. Wow. So in, to go over that, I did a generational study where we ha- the Book of Mormon is basically a thousand years. And if you just search on the internet of how many generations are in a thousand years, you get anywhere from 27 to 33. So okay. the average, we should have about 30 generations of writers in the Book of Mormon. And it was a little bit hard, but if you look at my report and the study and look at the addendums, you see that there's only 20 generations there. Yeah. Um, that's a problem, I would think. Just biologically speaking alone, if we're missing 10 entire generations in a single thousand year span of time, that tends to strain credulity just at the onset. Yeah, it makes the Book of Mormon go really quick. <laughs> Fair enough. It may not seem like that when you have to read it from start to finish, but. <laughs> once, once you uh, weed out all of the end it came to passes, then it's uh, it's about a pamphlet, as I think uh, Mark Twain said. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and finish up that paragraph because I think this is really important to kind of contextualize the the lifespan of the people that we're, we're discussing here. So most writers spent their early years fighting the Lamanites or going on missions. They married in their 30s or 40s um, to Nephite girls in their teens and 20 years their junior. So many of the writers had to remarry after the death of their first wife to continue having kids into their 60s, 70s, and 80s and 90s, if you want to add teens. (laughs) And yeah, and much, much further (laughs) Of course, there is nothing wrong with this, but it is just something you did not generally consider as you read the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and I think we'll talk on that, I think, kind of at the end of the conversation here. But there are a couple of good points that you make here. You said in a later paragraph, a curse research of the Internet postulates there's about 30 generations in a thousand years. You already said that. This estimates a new generation is born with a father is about 33 years old on average across the whole millennia. This is a heavy contradiction to the Book of Mormon, excluding the Book of Ether, which we'll talk about the Book of Ether because it's an anomaly, with only 20 20 generations with the average age of the father at 50 when his progeny is born. Wow. 50 years old when the progeny – and I assume that we're discussing the progeny are the subsequent writers of the Book of Mormon, right? Because it's passed from one writer to the next to the next and usually through familial lines. So we're assuming that the progeny was born at 50 or later that were then became the subsequent writers of the Book of Mormon, right? That's the general rule, just based on math that you're going to find. We do have exact birth dates for some writers when their fathers were much younger than 50. But obviously for this to go over a thousand years, the average has to be 50. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so the, the first paragraph in the generational study, it says, before we get into each individual writer of the Book of Mormon and how long they lived and what they were doing when they lived, I did a generational study. From the first writer, the prophet Lehi, born about 645 BC, to the last writer, Angel Moroni, born 350 AD, is about one millennia. This makes 20 generations plus or minus one. I found it easier to do this study based on the dates of birth of the writers as opposed to the dates of death, even though we have 17 exact death dates compared to three birth dates. That makes things tough when we're trying to guess the age of somebody's kids or the age that they were living when they had a a specific child when it only really gives death dates of these individuals. I, <laughs> I'm i just appalled that you were able to compile this information based um, essentially on the death dates alone of these individuals. Yeah, it was um, a little bit difficult to uh, go back and try to find all the exact dates, but I did come up with a couple rules that you'd mentioned about earlier, which I felt were necessary to help keep the overall study in context. Okay. Do you mind reading the paragraph that starts with almost all? Because I think that qualifies some interesting information that we'll get into here uh, in a little bit. Okay. So almost all of the writers were warriors who fought in battles. They were all neophytes, but not all of them were righteous. However, the Book of Mormon teaches against polygamy and concubines. Consider most writers were in their 40s and still having children. 
Studies today tend to show only 13% of females can have children past the age of 45. Even if most of the writers married women 20 years their junior, the wives would likely have had to die for them to continue having kids into their 60s and 70s or even 80s or 90s. Uh, your mind can really wander thinking about just how many consecutive wives some of these writers had and at what age they were actually marrying the Nephite girls. I think that introduces some interesting contradictions to what is claimed in Jacob about, um, you know, banishing polygamy, that it's an abomination. Uh, and, and I want to talk to you about that once we discuss uh, a couple of the generations here, because this is, I think, where it really begins to become fascinating. You actually give scriptural citations for each of these generations uh, when they, they transition from each generation to the next generation, who the next author was. Uh, who their father was, who their son was. And it, it just shows a steady line of uh, possession of the plates from one person to the next to the next through these 20 generations. I'm just – this is so invaluable of information to see. And you were nice enough to highlight in yellow the exact dates when they happen to be included in the Book of Mormon, which is really convenient. We do know that this person died at this exact time. Uh, therefore, we know that they must have been born at about this time, usually when it gives their age at the time of their death. So that's – let's discuss this a little bit. Um, let's just start with the generation one because that is Lehi. You know, we know the story of Lehi leaving Jerusalem with his sons and, you know, he was – they they had to go back into Jerusalem to get the brass plates because that was the the stories of their forefathers and whatnot. Uh, do you mind reading the generation one for us there? Yeah, so Lehi likely had teenage children prior to 600 BC. So a rough estimate is he was born no earlier than 645 BC. In my opinion, he's probably born before that. But his death date – Really doesn't matter, but the earliest he probably died was 585 BC, making him approximately 60 years old when he waxed old. That's a quote from First Nephi. He was having kids, i.e. Joseph, as old as 53 years. Sariah, Lehi's wife, would have been having children into at least her 40s. Hmm. Okay. I find that interesting. So his wife, Sariah... I even if she was 20 years his junior, having kids in her 40s without modern medical care, that alone is kind of tough for us to wrap our mind around today. I mean, the majority of women do, you know, they they essentially stop bearing children around the age of 40 and the birth complications skyrocket or the chances of having complications with childbirth skyrocket once you hit about the age of th the threshold of 35 to 40 years old. So having uh, – living in this time and space where modern medicine didn't exist, it – that strikes me as a bit unbelievable – that even Sariah was having children into her 40s, and that seems like even a conservative guess at the onset. Yeah, that's definitely a conservative guess. So, yeah, I, I think uh, getting some women with a lot more knowledge on how late that in their 40s they'd feel comfortable having children would be a, a good source for us. But uh, we definitely don't see a lot of women having a lot of kids into their 40s, and she definitely had multiple. Okay. Let me see here. I'll, I'll let you take this. What is another one? Uh, let's read just a couple of these generations. What, what were some that kind of struck you as a bit of outliers when it comes to age? So one of the first ones, uh, of course, we have Lehi and Nephi. And then we have the brother Jacob. So Lehi and Nephi, they both died probably in their 60s. Whereas Jacob, he lived to be 97 years old. I'm not sure how much uh, genetics really plays into total age, but <laughs> when you're outliving your brother and dad by 30 years, I mean, that says something, I think. Yeah, no kidding. And you, you did make the point uh, in Generation 3 discussing Enos. Uh, it says, either way, they lucked out in the gene pool despite Lehi and Nephi living to be only 60 years. Enos had a kid at the age of 60 years. That's uh, pretty remarkable. I, I mean, and granted, 
It's not that surprising to see men having the having children beyond the age of 50 or 60, but uh, for to even postulate that they had wives that were 20 years their senior that were having kids and multiple kids at this time, that seems to that seems a, a very hard thing to believe in my mind. Yeah, these definitely weren't accidents. I mean, obviously you can be blessed by God to have lots of kids, um, so that might be an apologist viewpoint. But uh, Enos and Jacob aren't even nearly the most outliers in the study. Do you mind reading uh, Chemish, the son of Omni? That's generation five. I think this is a fascinating uh, insert in here. So we have to completely estimate the birth and death dates of Chemish. So I I show he was born 350 BC and he died 260 BC. We assume his dad was 50 when he was born. Chemish died several years after his brother Amaron, who died in 280 BC. That's a exact year. His son was born in the same year Amaron died. So using our general rule that the father can only give the plates to a son who is 20 years or older, we have a death date for Chemish of 260 BC. So he dies at 90 years while having children at 70 years old. Fascinating. So what – okay, you did set out a couple of general rules that we didn't really discuss before getting into this. Can you describe what those general rules were and why you made those assumptions in here? Okay. So the first one we just went over, it's that the father can't give the plates to a son until he's 20 years or older. And so the reason for that one, first we have Mormon, who we know was a sober child, And he wasn't allowed to go get the plates until he was 24. And then we have Joseph Smith, who wasn't allowed to go get the plates until Mm mid-20s. I can't do the math off the top of my head. (laughs) So we have... Uh, 22, I think it was. 21 or 22. Yeah. So kind of using those two guys, um, I mean, some of the greatest prophets that we know of, um, they weren't even responsible enough to go get the plates up until they were into their mid-20s or early 20s. So just a nice even round number. And just to go on the conservative side, I went to 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and despite that, there's still outliers that we know of where some sons got the plates much younger than 20 years. Okay. And and it does explicitly state when when that does happen, right? It does. Yes. Okay. But and th- those were those were the only outliers. By and large, you did just kind of stick with the assumption that twenty years was a reasonable time for uh, a new author to take over the the job of uh, the author or the the prophet or whatever, right? Yeah, I, I just didn't want to be show too much criticism. I just wanted to be as fair as possible and try to throw out a number that everybody could get behind because I didn't want to write this as an anti Mormon study or article. Uh, if I were a true believing member, I would really enjoy this because you actually learn a lot as you go through this about the people. So like growing up, I mean, these guys are your heroes. You have them on your wall on posters and you can actually <laughs> learn a lot more just by the birth and death dates. Right. Little TN come action figurines and whatnot. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I think once we get into uh, Alma, uh, that's uh, – in the paper you said the study of Zarahemla and the reign of judges. This is where the chronology really starts to get complicated. Yes. We have to back up a few years to the birth of Alma 1, which gets us back to the eighth generation. Even though Alma 1 was 20 years senior to Mosiah 2, their kids were contemporaries. But it is more realistic. Alma 1 was seven generations from Lehi as opposed to eight generations. The reign of judges started in 91 B.C. Now this is this is beginning in generation eight uh, with Alma one who had an unknown father. It was given an explicit birth date of one seventy four B.C. and this uh, this is where my mind begins to melt. Yeah. <laughs> this this starts to get really confusing really fast. It does. If you haven't read the Book of Mormon um, and you don't know it fairly well, uh, this study is going to go right over your head. Um, so it, it does take quite a bit of study about the Book of Mormon to uh, try to figure out what's going on here. But Alma 1 and Alma 2, uh, those are definitely very interesting. Um, and you can you can skew the numbers there and the birth dates and death dates mm-hmm. to really show problems with the chronology. So, But 
I, I think I fudged the numbers just a bit to show uh, to try to fit it into the chronology to make it as conservatively plausible as you possibly can, right? I mean, Correct. when we're talking about skewing the numbers, you're not skewing them to make this look implausible. You're skewing it to make it be as plausible to fit within the single millennium that is included in the Book of Mormon, right? Yes. So specifically when you're going through the study, the question you want to be looking at is uh, when was Alma the Younger born? Was he born in the forest? Was he born... After he returned to the land of Zarahemla. And, and so when you really dig into that, then you start to see some possible problems with the overall chronology. But it, it is hard to pin down. I can do it. Um, yeah. Do you want to read the, the Generation 9, Alma the Younger? Because I think you describe it really well just in that paragraph that you have. And so it makes much more sense if Alma 2 was born in the land of Zarahemla as opposed to the wilderness, making him missionary age. By the time he is converted to the gospel, that's about 20 years old, after persecuting the church. So we have some evidence that he was born in the land of Zarahemla in Mosiah 27.16. So Alma the Younger had several sons of missionary age in 74 BC, meaning he was having children very soon after his conversion to the gospel at about 21 years. This contrasts to the sons of Mosiah, too, who went on missions while Alma, too, stayed behind to become the chief judge, get married, and start having children. Our estimation has Alma, too, dying. He didn't really die, but he died younger than any previous writer up to Generation 9 at the age of 48. <laughs> the Mormon just says he was on his way to proselyte when he vanished, so he yeah. probably just killed himself in a stampede of wild horses or something else on the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, tapirs. Uh, so at, at the age of 48, I, th I find that amazing. That was younger than any previous writer or that he disappeared. He was translated, whatever the case is. Yeah. Uh, and that age of 48, you know, if we include the mortality or child mortality rate, 48 years old would have been an old man to somebody living in 72 BC, right? I mean, 48 would have been, uh, you know, one of the elders of the tribes. Granted, I, I mean, if we exclude the child mortality rates that, that, uh, you know, incorporates a much more realistic number, but still even 50 years old for somebody living in 72 BC, that is an elder of the tribe. But what we're talking about here is that is the youngest of these authors. Well, to be incorporated in the study that, that that was you know was one of the the Book of Mormon authors, that is just yeah yeah and he was the youngest up to this point yeah okay up to this point okay I, I'm glad you qualified that but still I, I'm surprised by this now an apologetic could be made that oh well these were blessed prophets they were you know endowed by God that they could live longer than the average human being. Uh, he had a plan for them. He wanted to keep them on earth longer than the average human being was at the time. That apologetic can be made, but that doesn't make it fly any less in the face of standard biology and human life expectancy rates uh, that have been, you know, fairly consistently understood for, you know, thousands of years. So I, I just, I find this whole thing, this whole timeline, when we put it all together in aggregate, it's really, really strange credulity. No, I, I agree. So, of course, there's a lot more. Uh, I, maybe I'll tack on at the end of this interview where this is posted up for people to see themselves because, you know, we've only just kind of scratched the surface. But I want to talk to you about the Book of Ether because I think this is where things really start to get wonky. Can you kind of introduce us to the, the timeline of the Book of Ether? Yeah, so Ether um, in Chapter 1, it gives us the genealogy of – Everybody from the time of the brother of Jared up until Ether, and after Ether, we also have the name of Coriantum or mm -hmm. Coriantumer. And kind of like the Bible does with the genealogy of Jesus, it gives us name after name, son of, son of, all the way down to Ether. But there are three exceptions in chapter one of Ether where it says that this person was a descendant of this person. Whereas okay. every other person, it says he is a son of. So I mean, I we're all descendants of Adam in this line of belief, right? I mean, but it, it, it sounds like they're almost conflating son of and descendant of. Is that right? Yeah. And so Ether gives us 30 names 
of his direct ancestors. Okay. So Ether, I'm pretty sure, makes 31. So basically we have 31 generations. And so from our previous generational study, we know that 30 generations should be about a thousand years. Okay. Now, if we actually go back and look at the time period from the time of the brother Jared, from the fall of Babel, or from the fall of the Tower of Babel, um, up until Ether, uh, we have a lot longer time period than that. Yeah, I was going to say, this is, that's, I don't even know what that is. How many, is that multiple millennia? So cursory information I have is the brother of Jared lived in the time of Nimrod. Um, and Nimrod was like a great grandson of Noah. And that okay. doesn't really help us a lot, but I, I guess 2280 for their brother Jared. And then for Ether, we have about 350 BC. Okay. So we have 1930 years. For 30 generations. Yes. And so now as you read further into the book of Ether, you learn what he means by descendants. So okay. he actually uses the term descendant and son of interchangeably, which I find is a huge mistake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I mean, there are – I'm fairly certain there are hundreds of descendants of Parley P. Pratt right now, but he didn't, uh, he didn't exactly have hundreds of sons. No. And so here's the point with this is – to make that chronology and that genealogy fit for the book of Ether, Ether basically skips 14 names, at least. Wow. It just mind boggles me why you would go out and list the names of 30 people, skip 14, and just keep going. Like, yeah. What is the why? point of adding the other 30? It, it almost sounds like it was an attempt to make the, the entire chronology synergistic, but... It was just a, a complete lack of understanding of math and of what a generation means, right? Well, and it's just trying to make it more biblical. But how would we feel about the genealogy of Jesus if they just skipped 14 names? Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and even 14 names that they skipped. Let's say there is a mistake in a single one of those. Doesn't that throw off the entire lineage? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. That's... It's just so mind-boggling at that point that it's just whatever. Yeah. Um, but for a, a belief system which is so heavily based on direct uh, father-to-son lineage, having just 14 names up and missing is uh, – I, I can see how that's problematic. Yes. So I want to uh, I want to give you an opportunity to read through your post summary. It's not too long and I think this summarizes everything really well. Do you mind doing that for us? Okay, so we learned a lot from the study. If you read it, you will. Uh, we learned most yeah, writers live long lives and were having children past normal childbearing ages. Most writers remarried to continue having children. The plates were generally not passed on to the firstborn son, rather to one of the lastborn sons, whether they were righteous or not. There are a lot less generations in the Book of Mormon than one would expect based upon historical research. The Book of Ether has its own problems to include misspellings. That's a good one. Read that one for you. And oh, yeah. ambiguity. It also has its own lack of generations, mostly due to an incomplete genealogy. Despite these errors and inconsistencies, the Book of Mormon can stand upon itself in its own chronology. There are no major problems with the chronology. This leads one to admit the book is either a true historical document or it was produced by a learned man. Uh, the Book of Mormon was not written in a short amount of time or told from memory. If it is not historical, someone spent a lot of time to make sure that there were very few mistakes. Whether you believe in the divinity of the Book of Mormon or not, I hope you learned some foundational information for some of our favorite childhood heroes. Mm -hmm. And I just wrote, I, I did this study for my own personal reasons, uh, just for my own fun. I'm open to feedback via email. My email's on the, on the study. I hope one way or another you'll be able to use this uh, information provided here to help your overall understanding of the Book of Mormon. 
Well, let me just say, uh, it has definitely broadened my understanding of the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is, I read this study, uh, a couple of weeks ago when a friend sent it to me. And then you just got in touch with me just uh, a couple of days ago and sent it to me again. And you've, you've shinied it up a little bit. And I have to say, this is really fascinating to say the least. And, you do, you do make a good point that it's either a true historical document or it was produced by a learned man. Somebody, whoever wrote this, spent a good deal of time and effort to make sure that there weren't any massive holes that we could, you know, that were not easy to fill in. Now, granted, it sounds, you know, just off of the 20 generations that you include in here, you do have to skew things a tiny bit. In order for them to make sense, but skewing is a lot different than having, you know, massive gaping holes. And altogether, just on face value of the Book of Mormon, it's fairly consistent, which is surprising to me. Yes, I definitely agree. Let me ask you, um, you said you did the study for your own personal reasons. Do you mind sharing with the listeners what those personal reasons might be? You know, what kind of motivated you to, to put this thing together and devote the hours to compiling and writing this? Yeah, so I talked about it a little bit at the outset, but really I just wanted to, I was struggling with my transition and determining what I believed. Um, and also, Having been a missionary for the church, um, just stuff I testified about, like, hey, this is my testimony. The chronology is so complex. Nobody could have wrote up a God. And so when you're, I just wanted to be true to myself. I'm like, okay. So I said all that stuff, but I really didn't study it. Did I really skepticize it as much as I should have? And so I, I really wanted to go through, look at it at face value um, from a chronology, historical type of standpoint. And just do it for myself. And once I got done, um, I found out more information than I thought I would have. And there's a lot of information that even as a, a true believing member that I would have enjoyed having. Um, if I were still going to church, I'm, I would use some of these stuff to teach about my kids because you can learn a lot. Like um, one of the prophets or writers in here basically became the prophet of like 12 years old. Younger than <laughs> Isaiah or anybody else. So uh, there's just a lot you can learn. Um, and I, I did learn a lot, but it, because there are so many outliers and there's so many inconsistencies, it really helped my understanding that, um, the Book of Mormon, I, I don't know who it was written by, but it's probably not divinely inspired. That's a solid takeaway. I want to ask your opinion on this as well, and this is something we just discussed a little bit before hitting the record button. We discussed uh, the biology and the plausibility of incorporating male versus female biology into this. Men, as you said earlier, can have uh, viable children uh, into their very, very ripe old age of, you know, uh, outliers of 80 or 90 years old. That's understandable. However, women, as soon as they hit that threshold of 40 years uh, and, you know, beyond 50, hardly any women are ever having kids. And if they do, it's usually not without severe complications. So given that the Book of Mormon in Jacob explicitly condemns polygamy, does that not require that God was killing these women off at the age of 40 or whatever so that these men could marry women that were once again of childbearing age at 20 or 30 or 40 years their junior and then remarry them? Or as an extension, does that not require polygamy if these women were not being instantly killed at the time that they were no longer uh, able to bear children? Isn't polygamy kind of necessary for the Book of Mormon to work? Well, it definitely feeds into the criticism of the Book of Mormon and the church that it's misogynistic. Um, basically, <laughs> if they weren't practicing polygamy, once the women couldn't have kids anymore, he just kills them. Yeah, that's the only way for this to work. Yeah. The other way is the writers pulled to Joseph Smith, and despite having evidence of no polygamy commanded by God, they started practicing polygamy later on which is a little bit nicer to the women because he's not killing them, but he is um, basically just using them for their childbearing status to have a ton of kids. Yeah, it's broodmares. 
I think that <laughs> that might be the most fascinating overall takeaway. Either God was incredibly misogynistic because he was killing women as soon as they hit 45 or he was incredibly misogynistic because they commanded that polygamy cannot be done. But the only way for this to match up biologically speaking was for polygamy to happen or God was blessing these women somehow to defy biology and allow them to have children into their 80s and 90s as well, right? Yeah, he could have been pulling an Abraham and Sarah, I guess. But uh, I, there's just no information about God blessing women with children in the Book of Mormon like he tried to do in the Bible. So it, it just yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense on where the women really stand – in the Book of Mormon, which I think is really sad. Although from the study, I, I think you do learn a lot more about the women than you otherwise would just by reading the Book of Mormon from yourself. Yeah, because it only mentions like three women and uh, I think two of them are whores of Babylon or whatever. So yeah. Like yeah. yeah, and it's nice to have a little bit of extra context and to see kind of the, the women were just – it was, I guess it's not explicitly said, but it's implied based off of this study and chronology that women were just that. They were only broodmares. They were just child disposers. That's all that they, they were used for in this. Um, wow. What a, what a pessimistic outlet, outlook on what we are discussing here. Man. So Colt, you know, what do you kind of hope to happen with this, this information once, uh, you know, I, you and I haven't really discussed beyond where, you know, if we're going to post this up or if you're going to post this up on a blog or something to that effect. But, you know, what what do you hope happens with this information now that it's all compiled into just 15 concise pages? And so really, I hope people of whatever status your belief is in the church will read it. Um, if you're a fan of Nephi, that you'll look into his life a little bit more with this study. You can actually tell your kids that hey, this is Nephi, this is how old he was when he died. And like I said, there's there's a lot of other information that you can glean from when they were called as prophets and when they got the plates. Um, and I think it might spice up some of the Sunday school lessons that the kids have to do as well. I think it's a lot better than some of the teachings that they have to go through, especially because these are your heroes when you're a kid. You're taught to idolize Captain Moroni and all that. Uh, for anybody else, I, I do think um, it definitely prompts some discussion on the chronology itself uh, and, and lets you dig a little bit deeper into, for your own ideas, what you thought of these guys and, and their ages and was it possible for someone to be having a kid in 97 and just little things like that. So I, I hope you get out whatever you want to get out of it, but uh, I definitely think there's some information to learn as you go through it. I'll just add that this does definitely increase the depth to the Book of Mormon when you do include that the, the – when you try and ascribe actual human faces to these and actually ascribe you know, human uh, limitations like age and the ability to bear children, when you try and add that uh, that qualifier and those limitations to these people, it, it kind of brings them to life a little bit more, I think, and actually ascribe proper birth and death dates, actually understanding their, their progenitors and their children. I think for anyone, regardless of what your stance is uh, for belief in the church, this is an invaluable resource. And I have to commend you, Colt. You did an incredible job at compiling this information and being very objective about it and your own the only time that you introduce any bias to it is you said i did this study for my own personal reasons other than that every bit of it is incredibly objective and i think that your conclusion where you say this leads one to admit that the book is either a true historical document or it was produced by a learned man i think that is a very rational conclusion to to postulate and I, I don't know. I think all in all, this is a very fascinating study, and I have to thank you so much for, for providing this and for sending it to me. This has been you know, quite a bit of entertainment for me this evening. Well, I definitely appreciate your commentary. Um, I'm definitely open to other ideas on how to uh, come up with ideas for death dates or birth dates, or if I missed any verses, definitely uh, I would like to know those to try to update this chronology a little bit to make it more concise. 
I'm definitely not trying to skew anything in favor of one way or the other. It's literally just a study. And I'm, I'm sure there's other information and little verses that I missed in the Book of Mormon. Because uh, I don't read it every day like I probably should. <laughs> I, I miss my 10 minutes a day sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I, I do as well. I find myself reading actual history instead of the Book of Mormon. So, Ditto. Um, Colt, do you mind giving out your email address for people to get in touch with you if they just want more information or they have anything they want to point out? Yes, my first name is Colt, C-O-L-T. And so the email is Colt underscore A underscore K at hotmail.com. Awesome. And of course, there will be that that email address linked up in the show notes if anybody is curious and, and wants to chase this further or just wants to ask Colt any questions. Thank you so much for joining me today, man. This has been incredibly informative, and I really hope that it gets out there. This is invaluable information, as I said. No, hey, thank you. Um, personal thank you uh, for the work you do and your podcast. And I, I've learned a lot from what you do, too. So happy to reciprocate. Awesome. Well, and uh, if there's no other drive to what I do, it's to create more Mormon history nerds. So uh, it's had an impact on you. So thank you so much, Colt. And uh, we'll hopefully talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Colt, for talking to us today. That was really awesome. Um, if you're interested in reading what Colt put together and what we discussed, you're going to find a blog post on realbookofmormon.org where you can look at this work for yourself or you can just chase the show notes for a link to it. Colt put a fair amount of work into drafting and redrafting this, and the final product looks really good with included tables and all of the names with estimated uh, Gregorian dates for uh, all of the metal plate authors. He really did a good job with this. So, of course, once again, thank you, Colt. That was awesome. All right. Let's get down to a little bit of business. Uh, we do have two new patrons. Looks like we have a new pledge by Dirty, just good old Dirty, and then a pledge by Amanda. So thank you both so much for pledging to support and becoming NAMO juvenile delinquents. That's really awesome of you. And if you do want to support and join the ranks of these people who uh, gain access to all kinds of extra special content that only patrons can access, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. You can pledge to support for as little as a dollar per episode and gain access to the Patreon exclusive feed. Those are the newest patrons, but of course, I do want to thank all of the highest ranking, uh, most uh, loving patrons who have pledged to support at a high level or for a long time. So thank you to Preston, Chris and Christy, Tyler, Judy, Jay, Frank, Clara, Philip, Clint, Mindy, Matthew, Karen, Shelley, Shane, Eric, Lane, Cam, Derek, Mark, Larry, Scott, Stewart, Lizzie in the Lab, Jared, Corrine, Howard, Brandon, David, Doug, Lynn, George, Dunin, Zena, Heather and Brandon King, Bevan, Darren, Marie, Corky, Zimu X Zeno, David, Greg, Devil Doc, Sarah, Daniel, Michelle, James, Jim, Colette, Bonnie, and Eric. Those are our highest class patrons. Thank you so much for pledging to support and really being the backbone that keeps this uh, this research endeavor going and just chugging along. You guys make it all possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, let's thank our people on the back end who keep everything going. First off, thank you so much to our social media guru, social media alpha and omega whiz, Julie, thank you. You are so awesome. I just really do appreciate what you do and everything you post on the Facebook and Twitter pages. Thank you to Jason Camo. He provides the music that is being played into your ears right now. Be sure to go to a aLostStateOfMind.com where you can listen to more of his music there. Thank you to Andrew Torres of the Opening Arguments podcast, as well as the law offices of P. Andrew Torres for providing legal counsel for this show. Thank you so much to all of the patrons who support and keep this endeavor going and make it so I'm able to continue keeping my nose buried in these books. Thank you most of all to those powerful individuals who press play every week for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism podcast.
Maybe this will add a little bit of depth to the relationship between the Kimballs and the Youngs. From later in The Life of Heber C. Kimball, written by Orson F. Whitney, quote, In September, following the organization of the branch in Menden, Brigham Young's wife Miriam died. She had been feeble for months, but in her expiring moments, filled with a supernatural vitality, she clapped her hands and praised God, calling upon all around her to join her in doing so. She continued in this happy state until she breathed her last, moving her lips in prayer when her voice could no longer be heard. Heber remarks that the deathbed scene of this zealous and devoted saint was to him another testimony of the truth and power of the everlasting gospel. This is the important part. Violet Kimball took charge of Miriam's two little daughters, and thenceforth, until after they were moved from Menden, the families of Brigham and Heber were as one. End quote. The preceding podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved.